Yeah, I met, I met Adam in Chicago my final semester at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. He was teaching free yoga classes to art kids. Um, and I was really, his classes really appealed to me because of his generous and humble style. Um, and I had some very ingrained ideas about outdoorsy culture being in direct opposition to living the city life I wanted to live and being an artist. And he sort of bridged this, bridged the gap in my mind in a really um, effective and beautiful way. Thank you. Art kids are also the best people to teach yoga to. <clears throat> all the things that I worry are too weird. Totally fine. Not at all. <laughs> totally fine. Yeah. yeah, it's great. It's like a, like a, you know, a class, an art class of yeah, sorts, a yeah. movement class. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so thank you so much for being here. It's been a journey. He came in from San Francisco last night and enjoyed some I-70 traffic after midnight yeah. and um, made it here. So thank you for being here and thank you to all of you for being here and supporting the art base as you do. It's, we're so grateful. Uh, I'm really honored to be here and I, I want to thank Matthew for driving me from uh, the Denver airport uh, last night. Um, I would be, as I was telling Katie, I'd probably be sleeping in a ditch if it were not for <laughs> Matthew. So thank you. Intentionally. Yeah. We, we decided it would be like an intentional. Yes. Pull over to yes, the side of the road, yes. take a dive in the ditch. Yeah. He actually mm -hmm. did sleep for a while. Though. Great. I did. <laughs> My late night resilience is very low. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I would love it if we could start um, by you just giving us a brief overview of your life um, through the lenses that we've sort of touched on in preparing for you being here, which are art and yoga and mental health. Yeah, a brief overview of my life. All no, right. no pressure. Get comfortable. <laughs> um, so This is where you say, buy my book. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, yes, I do have a book about these things if you, are, if you want more information. But um, uh, let's see where, where to start. I, I've been a, a maker of things like this for... Um, my entire life and have been drawn to, um, to, to craft, particularly visual craft, um, from a very young age. And um, I, I grew up in the, the northern Virginia suburbs um, and I went to Pittsburgh to do my undergraduate work uh, at Carnegie Mellon, which is a really incredible uh, opportunity to study. And it was in my my junior year of that experience that I had a really intense um, psychotic manic episode uh, and was, uh, was hospitalized for a month right around the end of my junior year of, uh, of college. And that changed the trajectory uh, for me. Um, and um, I guess it it changed the trajectory in terms of uh, I couldn't ignore the healing that I needed to do. Um, and, uh, and so healing has become just a really central motivation um, also for the creative practices that I do. So uh, there was a difficult kind of departure for me in my late 20s, around the time that I, that I met Katie, uh, I was doing graduate school study in, in Chicago, uh, at the University of Illinois at Chicago, another really incredible opportunity. Um, but that was also when I was really getting deeper into my yoga studies. And those two things, the, the art studies and the yoga studies, felt um, in tension with each other, I, I would say. And so it, in the sense that um, you know, me developing an, an identity, I suppose, a, a public-facing identity as someone who's very involved in yoga practice and very involved in an academic art world. It didn't really seem that the academic art world was open to that. And so I just sort of left, um, which was a hard, a hard decision to make. I, I kind of left that trajectory so that I could um, study yoga more, more deeply. 
um, and have always been wanting to, you know, synthesize this, what I call like my, my creative disciplines and my contemplative disciplines, um, because they feel very much part of the same ecosystem. They just have different, um, different results or different ways of being communicated with other beings. So um, I still live in Chicago, and thus is the end of my life story. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you. Mm -hmm. Would you say there's a tension between your contemplative practice and your creative practice? And do you perceive a dialogue between the two? Yeah, there, the biggest tension is in the like external facing aspect. And people are like, are you, you know, are you a yoga teacher? Are you a painter? Which is more important? And these kinds of things. And, and like, uh, like on Instagram, who will I be on Instagram? You know, these kinds of things. So um, the, the relationship internally is very harmonious, I would say. Yeah. Um, the, there is a sense that the contemplative practices um, don't have the same pressure because there isn't, you know, like when I'm working on a painting, there are stakes <laughs> to the decisions that I make. You know, the, like as you might be able to tell from my work, there's a lot of, um, you know, I, I make a decision, I let that decision dry, <laughs> and then I make another decision, and let that decision dry, and the work develops in this kind of um, stop-start way. And so the, the further along I am on a piece, the more is at stake with the next decision. You know, I find myself uh, repainting things a lot. But, but anyway, the, I guess I bring that up because the contemplative practices don't have, for me, uh, a goal in that same way, other than, other than feeling really good, actually. I, I would say that's the goal. Um, and often, good feeling is sacrificed at the altar of making, <laughs> making a painting, you know, or making a drawing. Uh, there's a lot of struggle. I think early, you know, maybe early in the yoga yoga practices, I, I was noticing how, um, how destabilizing painting was for me. A and yet, I really wanted to do it, but it felt like that was a tension. You know, I felt like I was doing something that was in opposition to the aim of the yoga practice. Um, and I had to realize at some point the traditional aims of yoga practice might not be, be my particular aims. Um, that I come into yoga as as a as an artist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's really interesting. Um, what are some of the most important aspects of yoga to you um, that are maybe hard to come by in a class at a studio? And I ask this right now just because you're talking about how why other people may come to yoga or you know the traditional aspects of yoga practice yeah. maybe aren't why you've come to it or why you practice. Yeah, that's a really interesting and I think very complex subject. And there, I, I should clarify, there are things that are traditional to yoga that are reasons that I come. Um, but I think that in our general experience of yoga in this sort of yoga studio culture that we have, it's more likely that we'll enter an environment where the physical body is foregrounded and um, we might even measure the advancement of a practice along physical lines. And so we, maybe we see somebody doing something impressive that looks like a gymnast, um, and you say, oh, that's an advanced practitioner. Um, and in a lot of yoga, I would say probably all traditional yoga, that is not the case. <laughs> um, that the, the physical body is the site of the yogic project. Like we're always using the physical body um, for our exploration, but what it can do uh, from the outside is irrelevant. Um, the, the subject of yoga, I would say, is the mind, really. Yeah. Um, and the mind is, is embodied. And so that's why, that's why these beautiful physical practices developed, you know, over you know, I think they started, they started to emerge, uh, in my understanding, ar around a thousand years ago and kind of came to flourish around 14, 1600s um, in, in India and in, and in the South Asian continent. So um, there is a relationship between 
uh, what we're doing in our yoga studios and that and you know traditional yoga in that way but um, I think what is really noticeably missing is the philosophy and the um, the privileging of the mental transformation rather rather than the physical right yeah um curious that we call it a body of work too yeah it's like you know when you think about a painting being the final product or something you present or show and this is just what people see but what what did you do to get to this point and is it is it conveyed in the work that you're making in the body of work what did I do to get to this point? Of, I'm, yeah. I guess, more just <clears throat> commenting on that it's called a body of work. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. Yeah, I feel like I st- I've always struggled with that. It was a problem in grad school. I remember yeah. people were like, you're making something that looks like this, and then you're doing this, and then you're doing that. What is your body, you know? Yeah. And I was like, it's here. Is yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so I've, I've had a hard time defining bodies of work within within the churn of my... Um, my creative practice. Um, this has been nice to see come out recently. Um, Can you tell us about yeah, drawings? Yeah, uh, they feel like a body of work, which is r- a very unusual and, and exciting. Um, and m- maybe I want to speak about why, you know, I, I think a lot about uh, bipolar disorder and, and what it means that I have it and um, how it might manifest in more subtle ways that aren't just you know me being sick, um, and sometimes I, I think about the just like the the dynamic range of things I want to make as being part of my nature in that way that that I'm interested in this and I'm creating this container and then there's this other thing and I'm interested in this and and the, and there is a kind of um, there's a risk of exhaustion and also things never getting done mm-hmm. <laughs> right, <laughs> which I think is maybe common to a lot of creative people's experience, that just like font of inspiration, energy that feels really fun to ride, but also feels like it makes a mess, a, a beautiful, chaotic mess of things. Yeah. And so maybe, maybe I'm having success at making a body of work with these because they're so quick, um, that, that I can make one of these drawings in a day, um, and not even in a full day, you know, that, that it might take a couple hours. Um, I'm enjoying... Well, okay, so, so I started making these in Colorado, so it feels nice that they're being shown for the first time uh, in Colorado. These, these started coming out, um, where was I? Moffitt? Is that a word that rings a bell? Yeah. Moffitt, Colorado? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I was in Moffitt, Colorado, and I was uh, admiring the mountains as one does, and uh, I was also really starting to feel this, um, this palpable sense of grief about a, a recent separation of, a, of an intimate partnership. Um, and I just started drawing these feet. <laughs> I, I think I, I was just imagining traversing the mountains, even though they were, they were at a distance. I was in the, uh, the plain. And I think that's something that, um, that my mind has done from a young age. Like I remember being in a, in a car as a kid and imagining, imagining myself like skateboarding over telephone poles, this kind of like looking as a sort of movement through. Yeah. Uh, and so maybe it just came from that kind of place of um, wanting, wanting myself to, to be all over these mountains and, and, and imagining the, them being built through this kind of action of, um, acu- of earth accumulation, you know, that, that on some Seven level, yeah, 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 yeah. Something that moves slower than me is walking to create yeah. those mountains. Um, and something about, you know, the loss of, of relationship with someone that you really care about and the the distance. I think I was. I was very. I was picking up on um, wanting, wanting to close distance. Yeah. And so these drawings are, they're grief drawings for me. I realize that they don't necessarily feel that way, um, but that's where they're coming from. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they feel both light and heavy. So mm. They have like a push and a pull. And yeah. Yeah. 
yeah, one of my primary teachers, uh, whose name is Yoli Maya Ye, she's, she's been teaching about grief lately. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that's been really um, important for me to hear is that um, grief is kind of a, a container for really all possible emotions. Like all, all of our emotions are present in the experience of, of living loss. You know, and so, so there is a joy of grief, you know, um, in addition to the despair and the sadness yeah. of grief. And yeah, yeah that, that feels expansive in a lot of ways. I feel like we, as a society, can probably relate to grief these days, the last couple of years, and the things that people are experiencing collectively, but also individually. Yeah. I think that's a big a big source for a lot of people. Um, conditioning seems to be a core principle in your philosophy. Um, why do you think so much about conditioning? Can you talk to us about that? Yeah. Um, so many angles I could approach that question from. I think I'll start by just saying that uh, my, early, my early creative practice, so the, the paintings and writing that I was doing in my 20s, was really focused on a kind of um, critique of, of conditioning, I suppose, and, and particularly um, what I felt to be the, the conditioning of this mm, middle-class suburban um, environment that I was that I, that I was really conditioned to be a part of. Mm -hmm. um, and losing, losing my father very young um, was an interesting, you know, to return to grief, I suppose. You know, when, when, I, when I lost my father um, as a teenager, very abruptly, there was this interesting moment of seeing that like, oh, this, this there is no conditioning for this experience. Yeah. I, have, I have not been, um, trained to understand how to metabolize this, and that that think I led me to think about um, the walls that are created through through our conditioning. And of course, when you start looking at yoga philosophy, so much of uh, yoga philosophy is about dissolving constructs. Mm -hmm. You know, um, learning how to really perceive the world free of conditioning, if such a thing is possible. Uh, and so I've, of course, been interested in like what this thing that we call bipolar disorder is, you know, um, what that, what it means to, to have that be kind of uh, a framework for my perception, mm -hmm. you know, and, and thinking also about paintings as opportunities to decondition um, the eye mm -hmm. through a not, you know, not through, I think sometimes we imagine deconditioning, it's like destruction, but I think that beauty can also recondition or, or cause conditions to dissolve. And, yeah. Um, so. yeah, I mean, in your book, you talk a little bit about, you know, being an A plus student and really high achieving and like having this drive to perform at a really high level. And then um, you're visiting colleges with your mother and your father dies unexpectedly while you're visiting a school yeah. and you're a teenager. And you know, none of that went the way anybody expected yeah. it would go. Yeah. And so you were already like at this really high level in all aspects of your life and then your father died, and then you sort of shift into art school. Yeah. And you still are trying to achieve at this really high level, and you are, mm -hmm. and because you're conditioned to do so in a lot of ways. And so the way that I read that is that you sort of, your, your mind shifted, and your brain shifted, and you had this psychotic break. Mm -hmm. and. I wonder if you could talk about that time with us a little bit and yeah. going from creating art and being in the hospital 
and like what what that meant for you before and and after like that shift in that time it, yeah. it, while you were in school yeah which I think it's really interesting too yeah I was just prepping for um, finals you know if you've been through art school you know it's like a really interesting period of time where um, all the study that you're doing suddenly becomes independent you know and you're um, you're building complex yeah complex projects or presentations or writing and so uh, I was in that and it's easier now in hindsight you know having worked with this disorder and, and having it named there's, there's something really you know there's a lot at stake about naming something like that saying you know you have you have an, a condition like this um, and I, I have a lot of friends that struggle but perhaps not as um, dramatically as I've struggled <laughs> um, who are you know wondering about taking on a name like depression or um, or bipolar disorder and the there are pros and cons there you know there are pros and cons to taking on a label like that um, but one of the one of the pros for me is looking back at my life pre psychosis and being like oh yeah it was really there right. it was really um, so, so the, the years of art school were so amazing. I just remember feeling like my, my head was just opened up and people were introducing all of these beautiful ideas I had never been familiar with, you know. Um, and I was so inspired and yet there was like this really unstable sense of self-regard, mm -hmm. you know, which continues, frankly. Um, that that uh, the the sense of kind of self confidence is really waver it really wavers. I would say that's that's part of it for me. Um, and so so feeling you know feeling really on the ball for a week, and then the next week feeling really just um, worthless. Mm -hmm. This kind of sense of um, un unnamed shame, or um, like where is this where is this uh, self-loathing coming from really yeah. you know uh remains an open question yeah. but but um when i in the the probably the month preceding the hospitalization this is one of the very interesting things about this particular condition is that um the the period preceding mania is known as hypomania uh, is really just, if you were to observe someone in that state, you'd be like, wow, they're doing great. You know, uh, my, my creative brain was very stimulated, uh, but I was very grounded. Um, I felt like a lot of the neuroses that tend to contain me were temporarily gone. Um, and, and so for having never experienced the sort of wash cycle of this um, condition, you know, I just thought like, oh, finally, you know, yeah. finally I'm free of, uh, of that depression or, or whatever. And then <clears throat> it was very fast, you know, you stop sleeping. And at a certain point, you know, I think that the best way that I can explain psychosis is um, uh, exhaustion while still being awake, mm. you know. And so I, I could not sleep. And after three or four days of that, my mind is just moving a million miles a minute. And also this sort of propulsive creative energy so I think a lot of what appears like delusion is um, is attempts at making metaphor or analogy or um, but kind of um, overdone yeah <laughs> overdone and so um, so I was I was hospitalized um, it's funny like the details of it are in my book but it feels uncomfortable to say um, as a person here, it's like much more comfortable, to like read the book. Because yeah. <laughs> um, um, a lot of it is embarrassing, I suppose. Um, but the, the hospitalization, yeah, it was a month, which, which was a very long time. It felt very, very long in there. Um, being hospitalized in a state of delusion, it takes days to figure out where you are. Uh, and the, the, I just remember the come down of that experience being so emotionally devastating, mm -hmm. you know. 
Um, yeah, and then being in such an elevated state and yeah. feeling better, whatever yeah, that means for right. you, and then like realizing you're in a hospital. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've started being medicated and yeah, I've started to think about bipolar disorder as a kind of trickster entity mm -hmm. for that reason that yeah. it, that it comes in in this way that you're like awesome. Yeah, come on, <laughs> come on in. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, like it, it, uh, it was fortunate that that experience happened kind of right before summer break. I mean, obviously, um, well, I guess not obviously. I was fortunate that my, my professors and my colleagues were really understanding. Mm -hmm. And um, that has always been a blessing of my experience with this condition is that people have been really, really uh, open to receiving me in my, my honesty about it. And um, when, I, when I was getting ready to write the book, I thought, well, you know, worst case scenario is like, I can never get a job again and I'll just live with my mother. Yeah. Um, <laughs> not, you know, no disrespect to my mother. She's great. Um, that, that would not be a bad life. It would not be a bad life. But um, <clears throat> yeah, uh, I guess after, so I had, I had the summer uh, after my junior year to kind of rest and mm -hmm. try to get medication stabilized. I mean, I still had no idea what was going on. Um, and uh, or maybe by that, I just mean I didn't really believe that I had the yeah. disorder. You know, I was like, I understand what you're saying to me, but I just maybe had a nervous breakdown. Yeah. You know, uh, and also this whole psychological, pharmaceutical, industrial complex is garbage. Yeah. So that was how I felt, you know. Um, and then senior year started and I, I was stable. Um, I've been very privileged in my experience of the condition um, because as extreme as my illness can be, I also have had the ability to really bounce back from it fully, mm -hmm. which I, is not everyone's experience. Um, and I've been very lucky yeah. in, in that way. And so I, you know, I, I went into my senior year of, of college and did the work. I remember I made a long narrative film that was kind of about this. And uh, yeah, and then I just stayed in Pittsburgh and, and worked on making art for about four years. Okay. Yeah. So then I probably met you right after that. Right after that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, there was, a, there was another um, psychotic experience, maybe like seven or eight years after mm -hmm. the first one. Is that right? No, no, no. It was sooner, three or four years. And it, it took, as I talk about in the book, it took that second experience to really make me take it seriously. Yeah. Um, and that was when I started getting into yoga. So that's my next question. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. I, I really think it's interesting how you talk about um, how much we know about the brain, but how little we know about the mind. Mm -hmm. yeah. And how when we're taking a pharmaceutical drug we're altering brain chemistry which will inevitably go back to a former state or not inevitably but mm -hmm. can and so we're we're moving things around but we're not actually getting to the root we're not actually yeah. figuring out what's going on and so i'm curious how you know your your yoga practice has helped you stabilize and what that process has been like for you and yeah. how it's all related yeah, I, I feel called to start by saying that I, I am on medication now, and I really value it. And I think that when I, when I wrote the book, I was still a little bit mm, too dismissive of it as, as kind of part of one's healing framework. Um, you know, it's, and so my current approach with it is like I, I go on it, and then, and then I try to go off of it, and if it goes well, I stay off of it, and if it doesn't, I go back on. But... That's advanced bipolar disorder work. <laughs> um, uh, I, yeah, I, I feel that to talk about the mind is to, you know, to talk about the mind and to, to talk about the brain are in some ways talking about the same thing. But what is hard about, um, What's hard about psychiatry, I think, as a patient, is that um, my story of my life doesn't mean anything in that context. Um, and so the story of my experience with bipolar disorder 
is irrelevant to my psychiatrist. If I say, you know what, that felt like a spiritual experience, it doesn't matter. What, what matters is um, function and dysfunction. Uh, and so the psychiatrist's job is to, is to make me functional again. Yeah. Uh, and I'd say that with, I know it sounds very cynical, but I think it's an important job. It's an important job to make people, well, that sounds coercive, but to give people the possibility yeah. of, of functioning. Um, and so, you know, to, to talk about the mind, uh, that's where the yoga philosophy was just so needed for me. Um, the first mental hospital that I stayed at that first during my junior year was called the Western Psychiatric Institute and Clinic. It's an amazing facility in Pittsburgh. Um, and I remember thinking, I need to go to the Eastern Psychiatric Institute and Clinic. Because um, I was... <laughs> Because I was really, I, at that time, I was already fascinated by um, the discipline of yoga, but I wasn't a practitioner yet. Um, and I had watched, remember, I had watched this really influential documentary about Ayurveda, where they, and, and this is a like kind of traditional medicine of, of India. Um, and uh, I had watched this documentary where they were working on someone who had a psychological condition of some sort, and they were working on their body. It was like a, a full body massage. And the, the Ayurvedic physician was, was explaining the nature of the condition and the treatment. And I was just like, this is an entirely different paradigm. Um, and I wanted to wander over there and see if it would be helpful. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I, I was doing a little bit of yoga practice, uh, in Pittsburgh, but when I came to Chicago to go to grad school, for some reason the conditions were right where I just kind of started taking a weekly class um, with another painter that was in the program with me, mm, which was cool. great. <laughs> and um, she would always smoke a cigarette right after <laughs> the practice, and she was like, this is the best cigarette of the week, the cigarette <laughs> after yoga practice. I always thought that was amazing. Um, I have no idea what that's like. <laughs> Uh, and then, you know, uh, conditions made it possible for me to start practicing more regularly. I remember there was a, a work study opportunity, so did a little bit of work at the studio and then I could take all the classes I wanted. And so I was like, all right, I'm going to turn this up a little bit. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I think like most people, the experience of um, healing in yoga is just, it's shocking, frankly. Yeah. I think it's, it's really shocking. Um, and that's, yeah, that started that journey. It was just kind of daily, daily practice at that point. Um, you know, once I started doing a, a daily practice, um, that's when I, I feel like I caught a glimpse uh, of the, you know, the territory. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So how, how do you balance a commitment to decolonization while mm. partaking in a non-white tradition of yoga? Oh, that's a good question, yeah. <laughs> um, for me, the interest, it's maybe more than interest, but the passion for um, participating in decolonization uh, it has several dimensions. You know, I think there's, there's the dimension related to the land that I live on, and, and, um, and then there's the, the dimension, this very, you know, this minefield, really, of being involved in yoga, not just as a practitioner, but as a teacher. Mm -hmm. And to be um, a teacher, um, yeah, in this body, you know, um, I try to be. I try to be aware of maybe some of the blind spots that might be intrinsic in having this body and studying yoga. Yeah. Um, one of the ways that I try to work with. Mm, so. You know, decolonization in relationship to yoga. Let's say, let's just like bring it, bring it down to a, a, this more specific 
place, um, you know, I think that that has to do with uh, dissolving some of the conditioning that we have sort of set up in our culture, which commodifies and contains yoga in this very, very specific way. Mm -hmm. um, one of the ways is that, yeah, it, it kind of came through the door in our generation through the fitness industry. Yeah. So it's like fitness yoga. But the prior generation, it more came through the kind of like hippie interest in meditation. Mm -hmm. And so that generation has a pretty different um, kind of understanding. Uh, so maybe my, my decolonization uh, practice is in response to the increasing physicality and the, I mean, one of the things that feels really, it gets under my skin a lot is people sharing technique that is clearly from yoga tradition without sort of contextualizing it as such. Yeah. Um, and I think about what, what's at stake in doing that. You know, I, I mean, I, I participate in a teacher training for a, um, a, a yoga studio that is uh, specifically focused on psychologically sensitive yoga. So this is like trauma-informed, um, really incredible project. I love being a part of it. And in that space, which is sort of like the medical space, mm -hmm. there is a tendency to um, sever the cord in terms of explaining technique. So um, Nadi Shodana, the alternate nostril breathing practice, becomes, I think we call it like cardiac correspondence breathing. And it's like, oh, where did cardiac correspondence breathing come from, you know? And it's like, well, a doctor, a doctor went to a yoga class. That's what happened. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so I, I kind of feel like part of my job is to share technique in as accessible a way as I can, mm -hmm. while also pointing very clearly to the lineages of these traditions. And it's honestly, it's not just out of a like respect place, although it is out of a respect place. It's also because like that stuff, those, those lineages are incredibly rich. They're like rich beyond, I think most people's imagination. Yeah. Uh, thousands of years of practitioners honing and refining. I mean, it's amazing. And I think that people tend to not touch it because um, maybe because it feels like it's not, uh, as a white-bodied person, maybe it feels like it's not mine, yeah. right? Um, and that there, is a, there is a sense in which that is true. Yeah. And at the same time, the model created for understanding the mind, there's no parallel. I, th I feel like there's no parallel within Western philosophy. Not that Western philosophy isn't its own incredibly rich thing, but it's an entirely different yeah. thing. Um, so a lot, of the, a lot of the concerns, I think, in Western philosophy around the body and somatics and perception and phenomenology, like these are recent, mm -hmm. you know, 200 years maybe. Um, and in yoga, it's like, yeah, they've been at this. Yeah. <laughs> they've been at this for a very long yeah. time. So that's just a little bit of my decolonization. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I'm, I just have two more questions, and then I thought we might open it up if yeah. anybody's got any question. But the, the first one is you've been working on a curriculum or a, for a mood stabilization and yoga series, which we, we are offering. Yeah. Um, we didn't get a lot of sign up, but I think yeah. that's OK. Yeah, it's But okay. I want you yeah. to talk about that and just you know, yeah. tell us what you're working on. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I came with the in that intention is long standing to teach right at this intersection of yoga and mood stabilization. Um, so I've been kind of working on that for a while. Um, I feel it's probably obvious why, based on what you've already heard. Um, but what I want to do is offer um, accessible strategies for people that um, might find mood to be a central project in their lives in some way, right? Um, whether they're as you know, touched by fire, quote unquote, as, as I am or not. Yeah. Um, so thinking about just uh, the way that anxiety and, and depression um, affect so many people's lives um, and how we might think about, um, yeah, creating, creating a framework for ourselves. Yeah. 
out of philosophy and technique uh, to, I feel like mood stabilization is the path in, but it's, I think what's interesting is like, what happens when mood is stabilized, mm, yeah. you know? Um, I don't know how to put words on that as well. So yeah. we'll just call it yoga for mood stabilization. Great. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Um, and then my last question is about the book that you're writing. Oh. Am I allowed to ask about that? You can try. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I just, um, I loved reading your book. You. And I like the vulnerability of it. And I like hearing about other people who struggle with mental health. And I, I like hearing and knowing that, you know, people aren't alone. We're not alone. And I mean, I think I just keep landing on vulnerability and how beautiful your book was. And so I wondered if you could just touch on briefly what your second book will be about. Yeah, yeah, well thank you. I'm really touched to hear that you enjoyed it so much. Um, the second book is largely about the same stuff, yeah. you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's so important. <laughs> I feel that, you know, I wrote that book in 2014 and I feel like I have a lot more to say. Yeah. <laughs> so good. Um, some of the things that I talk about in that book are early feeling out of some ideas that I think now I'm really ready to elaborate on. Yeah. So it'll really just be more of the same, Katie. Great. <laughs> and there you go. That's <laughs> Stay tuned for yes. more of the same. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, does anybody, would you like to ask questions? Or we can also finish filming and see, like, mingle, whatever, whatever feels yeah. good. Or, yeah. Sure. First of all, thank you so much for being here. I'm really uh, moved and inspired by your journey and thank you for sharing with us. Thank you. I am always psyched to sign a book, yeah, <laughs> that's true. But I have a question about, uh, you talk about yoga supporting mood stabilization. And yeah. How or, you know, does your oh, art yeah. support mood stabilization? For that's a good question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, thanks for asking that. I think the first answer is it destabilizes me. Um, but in a, but in a, um, in a day-to-day -day way, in a, like a superficial, like I'm in a bad mood because this painting isn't going well way. Mm -hmm. um, but if I stop painting, which I have tried, uh, it's not the most lucrative field. I don't know if anyone knows <laughs> that, but um, I, I've tried to stop painting. And um, I think that for me, there's a level on which painting is emotional processing. Uh, and so without it, I get very, very um, tense without painting. Um, but I also think that it's this way of, you know, just a way of exploring my mind, right? When I'm, when I'm, in, this, when I'm in the space, um, you know, if you're, if you're open to a little bit more of an expansive frame, I think it's also a way of, for communing for me, you know, with with people and also with non-people. Um, and uh, I, so I think that it, it is a way of like, painting is a way of keeping the current moving. And that feels important in this kind of mood stabilization thing, yeah. Yeah. I have a question. Sure. Kind yeah. of building off of that. Um, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, my pleasure. Yeah. Or like consciousness, whatever we're calling the composition. Yeah. Especially with this series that we're looking at. And when you were speaking about it, you said it came from the, a place of wanting to be everywhere or to be all over the mountain. Mm. And so I'm curious about the idea of desire and where you think that lies on like the consciousness, whatever, art, yoga spectrum. Oh, yeah. Desire. It's one of my favorite subjects, actually. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> um, well, I feel called to say that in the, um, 
in the lineages of yoga that are known as Tantra, desire is sort of principle number one. Um, that there's this idea that this entire world, this manifest world, comes into being out of a sense of desire. Um, the way that's spoken about it sometimes is uh, awareness, this kind of unitive energy that we all are sort of sharing, uh, wants to understand itself. And so, and so the world emerges, right? Which is a lovely idea. Um, so I think what I'm, maybe what I'm hearing in your question, which might not be there because you didn't say it, um, is that uh, the yoga practices sometimes have this flavor of being anti-desire. Um, and that sometimes that's a particular way of reading Buddhist philosophy, right? Um, but I also feel it's not a great gloss of what Buddhist philosophy is. Um, the people talk a lot about detachment, you know, in, in uh, spiritual practice, being detachment as a kind of goal or, um, or an orientation to reality. I remember one time I was at a meditation retreat and uh, the teacher was giving a kind of spiritual talk about um, this principle and how they have a cat, right? They have a cat that they're, they're very attached to and that that feels like a problem. <laughs> um, and uh, I don't think, and this is, this is my opinion, which I feel is important to clarify, but like I don't think that that is really at the heart of detachment is sort of like keeping the world at a distance. I don't think that's what that means. Um, but I think it's more about um, staying attached to this sort of inner signal, which is um, the movement of consciousness. They're like flowing, which is this constant dynamic process and, and a realization that all of us as forms are dissolving, right? Like that, that is part of what it is to have a life is for it to end at some point, you know? And so um, for me, desire is at the heart of, of all of the disciplines, the creative and the contemplative. Um, when I, a lot of, a, a question I get often is like, how do you, how are you so um, disciplined about your yoga practice, right? Because I think a lot of us have, have this experience of falling off and coming back, and, um, and I do fall off and come back. But uh, the thing that makes me show up is like a desire to know more about my mind and like a desire to walk all over it, you know, and to, to, understand, um, to understand where I'm at in it, in its landscape, and, you know, to be like, oh, actually, if I turn a left here, there's this crazy cavern. That's really interesting. So um, I think that longing is at the heart of all of, of all of it, really. Yeah. Yeah. So much like, is that yeah. very something specific you kind of do when you're doing your art or thinking about showing your art? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I'm much more sensitive than I would like to be in relation to those things. Um, <clears throat> I don't show my work often. This is pretty rare. Um, uh, not because I don't want to, but just because I don't actively pursue it that much at this moment in my life. Um, and I think that that probably also comes from noticing that that I'm in a like tender place with creative process where um, to return to this kind of conditioning idea like I, I'm trying to let myself make things that are outside of the conditioning that I created for what it is to make my work you know it's sort of this weird like trying to shed my own skin feeling uh, and so there is a need to make the work without criticism right now, actually, um, beyond the 
constant criticism of my own mind, right? Uh, but I think that, yeah, what I, when, when you say like finding this place between right and wrong or a place where you're not sort of in a judgment space, yeah, that, that does feel very important um, to, bring, to cultivate in the yoga practice and to bring into this space. But I think that it, it's not, I, I, you could also say it's like a refining of one's discernment, right? Like you're still, you're still judging because you're still making decisions, right? I'm still like deciding I'm gonna use blue. Um, but the, the, what's at operation in terms of my intellect in that moment is more curious and more, um, more open, more patient, maybe more reverent. And I feel like those are all things that just really looking at your body and your breath helps to cultivate. Yeah. Thank you. Such a pleasure. Yeah, thank you.